problems in the past. I was just mentioning, uh, as you can see, I, I left a comment at the top of the uh, comment section today, just noting that there is the, manufact the manufacturer and the publisher of the calendar, uh, my extreme weather and climate calendar, told me uh, there is a one day only coupon valid tomorrow on Halloween. The coupon code is unsurprisingly Halloween, all caps. Uh, a link is in the comments and I'll post one uh, in embedded in the video in the in the recorded version available after this live office hour. So thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, and I know it's been a little bit, a little while be between uh, the last uh, live office hour and now. Uh, rest assured, I've been working on a, a bunch of things. I think uh, you'll hear about later and and uh, be interested to uh, hear about. But. Uh, for today, there were actually two things I wanted to talk about. One that is close to home in California, uh, the uh, the recent uh, fire weather event, and in some places still ongoing. There's still some strong winds and low humidity, as is not uncommon for the autumn, in particular late October. That's kind of peak season for that kind of stuff. And there were red flag warnings in effect, but there were no disastrous fires, fortunately. Uh, this is not... A surprise to a lot of fire folks. Uh, I think it's worth talking about why this event is very different than events in recent years and why the context really matters and in particular the vegetation moisture and the antecedent uh, lack of dryness leading up to this event uh, likely made a very big difference and on the other hand that's part of the reason why things were so bad a few years ago when we had similar offshore wind events uh, because the conditions then were just exponentially drier than they are at the moment. So it's a good news story in the short term, but I think it's a cautionary tale in the long run about uh, how we interpret risk from a wildfire perspective. I'll talk about that uh, in a California-specific context uh, a little bit later in the hour. But the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit farther from home for, for most of us, uh, but not so far from home, uh, is what has unfolded on the west coast of Mexico over the past week or so. In particular, uh, what the uh, situation is surrounding the catastrophic and unexpectedly catastrophic, uh, and this is very important in terms of impacts, uh, Category 5 landfall of East Pacific Hurricane Otis directly on the now quite substantial city of Acapulco, Mexico. Uh, this has uh, been something of a humanitarian disaster that has gone, uh, I think, under-recognized relative to its magnitude. Uh, this was, uh, there's, there's a lot of important lessons about extreme weather and weather prediction and climate change and disasters uh, embedded in this. But I also wanted to talk about it just to highlight the fact that this is a region that has been extremely hard hit, uh, a region home to about a million to a million and a half people, uh, where aid has been slowed and non-existent to arrive uh, even the better part of a week later. So this is a pretty significant uh, event and of course there are lots of other things going on right now globally and I think that this has gotten a little bit overshadowed so I did want to call a little bit of attention to it and also discuss it in the context of, of the lessons that we can learn from it more broadly. Uh, and so I think I'll start with that. I'm going to start with uh, the Hurricane Otis and its and what happened last week on the west on the Pacific coast of, of Mexico. Uh, a little bit of a primer: uh, hurricanes are inherently uh, a tropical uh, phenomena. You need really warm ocean waters for hurricanes. Uh, the same is true of uh, the other words that we use uh, to describe tropical cyclones in different parts of the world. In the West Pacific, it's typhoons. In the Indian Ocean Basin, it's cyclones. And then in the Atlantic and in the Eastern Pacific, it is hurricanes. Uh, all of these, by the way, are exactly the same thing. They are just different regional words describing the exact same uh, physical process, which is a powerful uh, storm spinning uh, cyclonically, as all low-pressure systems do in, 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 in either hemisphere, of course cyclonically uh, is reversed in the southern hemisphere relative to the northern hemisphere, uh, that draw their energy from warm oceans. So in, in, in very succinct terms, warm tropical oceans are hurricane fuel. And that is not true for all types of storms on Earth. Uh, in fact, other types of storms, like the kind that affect California more often, 
uh, like winter storms, uh, are actually called mid-latitude cyclones. Uh, these are storms that derive their energy from horizontal temperature differentials in the atmosphere. So this is actually uh, quite different structurally than tropical cyclones. They are not the same thing, and there's a reason why you don't get uh, mid-latitude cyclones in the tropics. There aren't temperature differentials that are strong enough to produce them, and why you don't get tropical cyclones in the mid-latitudes. The oceans simply aren't warm enough. Occasionally, you can get one type of storm or the other that uh, makes a beeline out of the tropics or into the tropics, and uh, they can temporarily be out of equilibrium with their environment, but generally speaking, hurricanes occur uh, in places where there are warm tropical oceans. And so in the case of Mexico, this means that there can actually be hurricanes on either the, the Gulf of Mexico side or the Pacific side, because uh, the especially central and southern Mexico are at a quite a low latitude, although Mexico does span a, a, a fair bit of latitude, of course, uh, at its northernmost point. Uh, uh, meeting up with the border of Southern California, and there are not very many hurricanes that far north, but in central and southern coastal portions of Mexico, both on the Gulf and Pacific sides, uh, there there can be hurricanes. Uh, ocean conditions are certainly warm enough to support it. They support it more often on the Atlantic or Gulf side, actually, than on the Pacific side, simply because uh, the prevailing wind patterns tend to direct uh, hurricanes into the coast rather than keeping them offshore. So in the in the tropics, uh, you have outs away from the immediate equator, you generally have tropical easterlies, meaning prevailing winds that blow from east to west. So you can imagine then if you're on the east coast of a tropical continent uh, versus the west coast, those east to west moving winds are going to tend to steer hurricanes that form out over the warm tropical oceans close to the coast or on the coast more often uh, on the eastern sides of continents, because those winds are blowing from east to west on both sides of the continent. East to west on the eastern side means towards shore. East to west on the western side, so in Mexico's case, the Pacific side, means offshore. So the prevailing winds in the tropics want to steer hurricanes away from the west coast of Mexico and out over the open ocean, which is why there aren't as many hurricane threats on the west coast. It does still happen, though, uh, and it tends to happen most often, actually, uh, portions of far southern Baja California, uh, as well as m more central p portions of the wet of the Pacific coast of Mexico, rather than the far southern portion or the far northern portion. So it's these central regions that have this combination of uh, winds that are at least occasionally not easterly, so they don't always steer these storms away, and are also uh, experience water temperatures warm enough to support storms formation, intensification, and, and maintenance of strength. So this is why Cabo San Lucas sometimes gets hit by pretty intense hurricanes, uh, but places uh, to the north and, and uh, really tend not to with, with the same kind of frequency. It all has to do with how warm the oceans are and these steering winds. Acapulco, though, is uh, significantly farther south uh, than the portion of the Pacific coast of Mexico that usually sees major hurricane landfalls. Uh, it does happen very occasionally, but they're often weaker storms and they're very infrequent. So the, the this stretch of coastline within about 100 miles of Acapulco has not in recorded history uh, ever had a major hurricane landfall. There have been a couple of tropical storm strength systems, so squally winds, but but uh, in, in terms of winds, that's not really a huge hazard, or weak hurricanes that have brushed by, but never has the city been uh, at the epicenter of a major hurricane landfall. And also, always relevant when talking about hurricanes, is the context of the urban development that's occurred. This is a challenge across, you know, really in all hurricane prone regions globally is that there's a lot more people living in them along the coast than there used to be in many cases. And this is certainly true in Acapulco uh, because there has been, you know, it's, it's a huge tourist destination now. So some decades ago, it was a relatively small uh, city of a few tens of thousands of people now there are a lot of folks from the, the there's been a lot of touristic development there are a lot of luxury highlight high rises uh, and hotels along the waterfront and so there's a lot of folks who have essentially purchased real estate from from outside of mexico who either live there or have properties there now of course there are also the people who 
live there and uh, who have lived there for a long time, and in many cases who li uh, live to support that tourism in the region. So all together, between the people who have who have sort of moved in from elsewhere and the people who already live there, there's over a million people living in this area where there were only a few tens of thousands of people just a few decades ago. So this was a rapidly expanding area uh, due to international tourist dollars primarily. And so the international airport has been expanded, the infrastructure has expanded, the city itself extends over a much wider area. Uh, but the other thing to realize is the geography of this part of the coastline is is rather hilly. So there, uh, this is not an area with a vast stretch of low-lying coastal plain. The, the hills and mountains rise pretty quickly out of the ocean here. Uh, and there is significant development it, from within the city itself, it extends all the way from the beach all the way up into the hills. So there's actually a lot of people who live up at higher elevations that are just a mile or so or even less from the open ocean itself. So what that means is when hurricane force winds blow on shore, uh, winds increase in magnitude above the surface. In fact, you can get a 10 or 20 percent increase in wind speed just by going up 10 or 15 stories. So there's a lot of 10 or 15 story buildings that were there and there's a lot of people living on the hills that were at least 10 or 15 stories high. So these winds that we're talking about uh, at sea level were maybe even 20% stronger than that uh, up at the higher floors of these buildings and up in the, the hillside communities around uh, the downtown core and around Acapulco. Al uh, it's a bit of a tongue twister, around the bay itself. So what happened? Hurricane Otis made landfall as a Category 5 storm with winds that were estimated around 165 miles an hour, sustained with gusts to 180 miles an hour or more, probably over 200 miles an hour, as I mentioned, on the upper floors of some of those buildings uh, and in the hills. Those are really violent winds. These are not winds that will knock over some trees and knock over some, some, uh, some power lines. These are winds that will destroy even well-constructed structures in some places. Uh, and really decimate infrastructure. It will essentially defoliate forests. So th there, there will be trees that don't really have any leaves or even uh, small branches left. There's a lot of standing trunks and branches. And you can see this already in satellite imagery of the region where the, what was once a, a very lush and green tropical forest has turned over the course of just a week completely brown, not because it's dry, but because all of the leaves have fallen off the trees and all of the branches have come down. Uh, the damage in the populated parts of town, of course, was really severe. And news has actually been pretty slow to come out because telecommunications have been completely down for days. Uh, there's been very little uh, electricity or, or cell phone coverage. so. What little information has come out, though, it paints a pretty stark picture of uh, extreme wind damage. Often when we talk about hurricanes, we're most worried about the water hazards. So the storm surge flooding, the ocean that can rise 5, 10, or even 15 feet sometimes and inundate areas with deadly uh, levels of flooding, or freshwater flooding, so these storms can bring enormous amounts of rainfall, uh, especially in mountainous terrain, and cause flash flooding and mudslides and things like that. Both of those things happened, although uh, the, the region surrounding the city itself is not particularly low-lying, so the storm surge was limited, although there were major floods and landslides that have cut off the region by road in many cases. This is one reason why it's so difficult uh, for aid to get in, is this is a coastal city, the airport has been closed, the port is closed, and most of the mountain highways to get there are also washed out. So getting in there has been treacherous and mainly done by helicopter. Uh, the, the, the real challenge here, though, in this case, and this is somewhat unusual, uh, it was the extreme wind damage. So usually the, the main hazard with hurricanes is, is water-related, but in this case there were lo certainly water-related hazards, but the wind actually was very extreme. Because as I mentioned, this storm came ashore, as far as we know, even though there aren't any reliable weather stations that stayed online or at the peak of the storm, pretty much at peak strength, at a category five strength, sustained winds of over 160 miles an hour, violent winds. The high rises along the, the, the coast almost look universally shredded. Uh, they are still standing, although there are some rumors that a couple of them even have structural issues, but none of them are livable or usable. And many of them may actually have to be torn down due to structural damage. So every single floor of every single high rise was, was blown out most of the, uh, the contents of these buildings was blown out. 
most of the exterior and interior walls were blown out. So essentially there's, in some cases, the steel skeletons of high rises that remain. Really dramatic, uh, pretty uh, awful footage there. But the challenge too is that, you know, these are the areas where people probably, granted, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, there was not a lot of warning, uh, but uh, these are the people who had the means to go elsewhere. Uh, these are the people who may not have been there in the first place because a lot of these are tourist or rental properties. The even greater damage occurred with the folks who uh, are not international uh, real estate speculators or, or tourists. Uh, up in the hills, the, the working class communities were hit really hard and pretty much every residential structure was either damaged or destroyed. So all of them received damage more or less. Uh, and many of them, maybe even most of them were substantially destroyed either by water or wind. Because again, 160 mile an hour winds, even fairly well constructed structures are, are going to see major damage from that intensity of wind. So there is a humanitarian crisis. There's essentially no fresh water, apparently, uh, for uh, an area home to around a million people. Uh, there are, uh, there, there's little electricity and little telecommunications. So a weekend, this is becoming a crisis. So I did want to call attention to that. Uh, from a humanitarian perspective, because I don't think this has gotten quite as much attention as I would have expected for an event of this magnitude. But I think part of why it hasn't actually has to do with what the other part of this that I wanted to talk about, which was the really concerning, uh, essentially a, a, a forecast bust. We don't often talk about uh, forecasts that went horribly wrong because often they're pretty good. We have pretty good weather forecasts these days. This is probably the single most dramatic and consequential example of uh, a blown forecast, uh, if you will, uh, that I can recall in, in really in, in years anywhere in the world. Uh, because this was uh, this storm, Hurricane Otis, was, it was uh, the day, uh, 24 hours, less than 24 hours before it made landfall, was just a tropical storm with winds under 70 miles an hour and was not expected to strengthen past perhaps a category one hurricane, a marginal hurricane, if you will, with winds of around 75 miles an hour or so. It wasn't even really expected to make direct landfall, though that forecast started to change at the last minute and there was a hurricane warning issued by the, the US National Hurricane Center, which issues uh, warnings uh, for uh, areas outside of the United States, sometimes uh, in parts of the Atlantic and Pacific basins. So this is something that's covered uh, by uh, the, the, the aus under the auspices of the National Hurricane Center run by the U.S. federal government. And obviously there's, there's coordination with, with the government of Mexico and the meteorolo meteorological services there, but this is within the domain of the National Hurricane Center, which is really the premier global center for predicting hurricanes. Um, and, and yet, uh, this storm was predicted to come ashore as a tropical storm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, maybe a hurricane, a minimal hurricane. I was not expected to make landfall in Acapulco directly. It was expected to make landfall uh, potentially uh, further up the coast, if it did at all, as a weak hurricane. That's a very different picture than having a category five, again, that's is category five out of five. This is the strongest class of hurricane uh, that you can get, uh, make landfall directly in a highly populated city with relatively little warning. So the uh, Acapulco itself was really only expected to see tropical storm force winds from this event at most. So up to 60 or 70 miles an hour. And then we ended up experiencing winds of perhaps greater than 160 miles an hour. So it, the, the, the winds were 100 miles an hour stronger than had been in the forecast. And if this storm had hit a remote section of coast, it would have blown down the forest and maybe affected a small town or two. It would have been less consequential blown forecast. But unfortunately, this one, this storm just made it, it the, the eye wall and even the eye went directly over the bay. Uh, so this was something uh, that just made the worst possible path toward a highly populated area with little warning. This rarely happens in the modern era. It is very rare to see such an extremely powerful storm arrive with little to no warning. Uh, 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 certainly warning commensurate with the magnitude that actually occurred. So this was a pretty shocking forecast failure. 
And this was even alluded to in the National Hurricane Center warnings and forecast discussions where the forecasters were sort of horrified by what they were seeing in the hours just before it made landfall because it was in the middle of the night and a lot of folks who were there were going to bed thinking this would be a pretty manageable, squally, tropical-type storm and then end up waking up, It's presumably at some point in the middle of the night, to a catastrophic uh, Category 5 storm shredding the city apart. Um, again, this doesn't often happen. It's not entirely clear why these errors uh, were, were so large. It is clear, though, uh, that there is very sparse a sampling of weather data in this part of the world. So, of course, over the open oceans in general, there's very few direct observations. We have satellites. Uh, we occasionally have ship observations, but there are very few in this area. For hurricanes, something that's critical are the Hurricane Hunter aircraft run by the, the NOAA and the National Hurricane Center um, that are based out of the United States. And they did make one pass with the Hurricane Hunters into the storm earlier in the day into Otis, but only one pass. And often when these storms are, a storm of this magnitude were approaching the U.S. coast, there'd actually be uh, a, a, a multi-aircraft team uh, making passes almost continuously into these storms to gather data and improve predictions. So in this case, we didn't really have much of that. There was just that one pass. That lack of real-time data may have played a consequential or even decisive role here. So that's one interesting uh, and frustrating piece because we don't have global coverage of that kind of data usually. Um, this is something that's pretty U.S.-centric. Uh, and then the background conditions are also worth talking about. The ocean temperatures in the region where Otis explosively intensified into, from a tropical storm into a Category 5 storm uh, literally in a day, uh, which is, if not the fastest rate of intensification on record, it would be the second fastest in the Pacific Basin. So this really is up there at the extreme upper echelons of the, of the maximum rate at which tropical cyclone can intensify, even theoretically. Uh, ocean temperatures, which again provide hurricane fuel, were much warmer than average in this region. So that provided much more than the usual amount of hurricane fuel. Uh, that is a combination of the ongoing El Nino event, which brings increases in ocean temperatures off the Pacific coast of Mexico and therefore increases in the potential maximum intensity of hurricanes during strong El Nino years, as this one is, and also global warming, which is making oceans globally uh, much warmer than they would be otherwise. And this year, keep in mind, is a year of unprecedented global ocean warmth uh, that has seen some really extreme rates of tropical cyclone intensification, including in some unusual regions. Uh, we just had a, a tropical cyclone in the Indian Ocean Basin, for example, make landfall um, near the Yemen and Oman border. This is a place that historically saw few, if any, tropical cyclones, and in recent years has seen a number of highly damaging landfalls because, of course, this is an exceptionally arid region that usually receives little of any rainfall, and these storms have dropped tens of inches of rain in just a day or two. Uh, we saw something similar in Libya, in North Africa, uh, from a Medicaine earlier this year with record-shattering Mediterranean ocean temperatures providing enough fuel, even in that shallow and narrow sea, to spin up something akin to a, a hurricane, uh, which produced those devastating floods in Libya that killed tens of thousands of people when the rains caused dams to fail. We've seen a lot of conspicuous uh, rapid intensifications this year, and there is evidence, uh, both that climate change is increasing the likelihood of very intense hurricanes generally, so major th category three, four, and five storms overall, but also specific evidence now, and this is uh, ev th this evidence comes from papers that have been written over the past decade, but some which came out even in the past few months, which further support this argument, that hurricanes are having an increasing propensity to intensify rapidly as they approach land in a warming climate. There's been a pretty significant increase in this, actually, in a lot of places. And the increase in the East Pacific Basin is a little bit murkier than others, simply because the background rate is so low that it's hard to get a statistically meaningful signal with this. But uh, I think it's this is one of those things that probably generalizes uh, to other basins where we haven't been able to demonstrate it yet because it's consistent in many basins and climate models also predict it that hurricanes in tropical regions are more likely to experience both very intense hurricanes and also rapidly intensifying hurricanes. 
And that's pretty concerning because this was a classic example of what happens when a hurricane intensifies rapidly uh, right on final approach to a highly populated region. It's actually a pretty nightmarish scenario because you can't do much about it. There isn't time to prepare. You aren't expecting it, but you're going to get the full, full-fledged full impacts of a Category 5 storm. The only thing I can think of in this case that was a mitigating factor was that Acapulco is not a highly storm surge vulnerable place for the most part. There was some storm surge, and it probably resulted in damage and maybe even some loss of life in some spots. But there are other regions on Earth that are catastrophically storm surge vulnerable, where you can get a, if you get a Category 5 storm uh, moving inland at, at the angle like this one did, you could inundate areas you know tens of miles deep. Uh, home to millions of people, uh, all of whom would be at, at immediate risk of drowning in that event. So fortunately, the geography here it was not conducive for that kind of catastrophe, although what we're dealing with is a different kind of one. But you can imagine, though, if you had a storm like this, uh, say, I- approaching the, the, the coast of Bangladesh, or any parts uh, of, the, of, the, of the Indian, other parts of the Indian subcontinent, uh, that have extremely shallow uh, coastal shelf that makes it extremely vulnerable to storm surge. Or play somewhere, say, on the coast of Florida, uh, St. Petersburg, Tampa, and Florida, uh, a rapidly and unexpectedly intensifying uh, a major hurricane at the wrong angle there could inundate essentially the subdivisions in the downtown area home to millions of people there. So there's any number of places in uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, the, the parts of the, the Gulf and East Coast of the United States, portions of, of Hispaniola, Central America, and the, all of the islands uh, in, in the tropical Atlantic, where this could be really catastrophic from a storm surge perspective if it were to happen. Because with that, you have to, essentially, with, at least with extreme winds, you can try and shelter in an interior building or a basement or something, and you'll probably make it out. But if you have a 15 or 20 foot storm surge that completely inundates everything in, as, as far as the eye can see under 15 to 20 feet of water unexpectedly and rapidly, there's not really any, anywhere where you can go unless you have a large multi-story building and then you're left with the extreme winds because you can't go underground, of course, and you can't, if you don't have a multi-story structure, you may not be able to escape to higher ground. So. Um, that's an even more nightmarish scenario, but this is an illustration of the fact that we're, this can happen. You can get some of these storms to blow up unexpectedly, and it doesn't happen that often, but there is still a weak spot when it comes to predicting rapid intensification. So hurricane predictions in terms of track have gotten way better. We have a be- much better sense of where hurricanes are headed, where they're going to make landfall or not, than we did even 15 or 20 years ago. That has improved dramatically. Intensity predictions have improved also steadily, but at a slower pace. So we're not as good as at intensity predictions for hurricanes as we are as tra- at track predictions. But the thing we're worst at is foreseeing instances where there might be rapid intensification. So, you know, this was a particularly conspicuous and consequential and dramatic example of rapid intensification being completely missed by all of the predictive tools at the disposal of even the best hurricane pre- uh, forecasters on Earth. But it's probably not a unique situation. And if climate change really is increasing the the, the favorability of conditions that could result in rapid intensification, that's a big problem. And it's going to cause major uh, concerns down the line because the inability to evacuate areas on very short notice for a very intense storm is really just, as as I mentioned, it, it is literally, I've heard from emergency managers who say, this is literally my nightmare. These are people who like I've like woken up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat because my nightmare uh, foresaw uh, you know a rapidly strengthening Category Five storm unexpectedly uh, off of uh, Tampa or Miami or something like that. Um, so I, I think there's a few lessons here. Uh, one, first of all, is that there is an ongoing humanitarian crisis there. It is quite localized. The only, you know, the other piece of good news is that this was a small storm. It's just that the very worst of it happened to hit the worst possible area. You don't have to go very far outside of the city itself to see much less damage. But the city itself is still largely cut off from the rest of the world and definitely needs more assistance than it's been getting. The second thing is that this is an interesting example of a very extreme weather event that had a very high societal impact that was poorly predicted. 
I don't think it's illustrative of us having less predictive ability necessarily in a warming climate. In aggregate, all of our weather prediction statistics still suggest that we're doing better and better and better overall at weather predictions. But even within that, there are there is at least the potential for catastrophic forecast failures. And this is, again, as I said, probably the most dramatic example that I've ever seen of this uh, that I can recall in recent years. And the other thing is that there is a climate change piece to this. Obviously, storms can rapidly intensify, you know, with or without a warming world. But there is now a growing amount of evidence pointing towards two key pieces here. One, uh, that the, the likelihood of seeing very intense hurricanes overall is increasing. Even if we don't fully understand whether or not we'll see more or fewer hurricanes overall globally, what is really clear is that the storms that do occur are much more likely uh, to become major category three, four, five storms. So there may be slightly more storms, there may be slightly fewer storms in the future. Uh, that may vary region to region, but what does appear likely is that almost everywhere where hurricanes can occur, more likely to see stronger hurricanes. Uh, which again is concerning because it is the strongest hurricanes that of course bring the greatest societal impacts. And we also expect to see increasing rainfall rates with hurricanes, uh, much as we do with every other type of storm. Although the rainfall rate increases with hurricanes in a warming climate might be even greater uh, than we might expect in other types of storms. But the other piece of this is that there is specific evidence now that is growing with each passing year that there is something about the way that the oceans and the atmosphere are changing in a warming climate that's going to favor increases in extremely fast intensifying hurricanes near coastlines. And that is not good news. Uh, it may have something to do with the fact that uh, the most rapidly intensifying storms are often the ones that are most out of equilibrium with their maximum potential intensity. So in other words, the in, it, if you were to look at one factor that describes the maximum intensity that a given hurricane could potentially achieve in a given environment, it's mainly the ocean temperatures, both the surface temperatures and the temperatures down to a certain depth, because when you have a hurricane, of course, you're churning that ocean water, you're mixing the cooler water from beneath up near the surface. So if you have warm water both at the surface, surface and at deeper levels, you're going to tend to get much stronger storms. If you have a weak storm, in that environment. For whatever reason, there's wind shear, there's just random bad luck that's keeping it from strengthening, but the ocean is supportive of a much stronger storm than is currently present. That is the most likely situation to see a rapidly intensifying storm, because you can imagine that if the constraints are lifted, if the wind shear decreases and becomes more favorable, then that storm is more likely to be able to leverage that extreme potential uh, latent energy, literally uh, latent energy in the ocean. Um, Oh, noticing uh, some noticing some gaps here. Uh, apologies. Um, I'm not sure if that's. I'm gonna have to quickly check and see if that is internet related on my side, or uh, let's just see. Um, all right, I'm going to take a quick break here uh, while, while I troubleshoot. Um, you may see an ad or something, but never fear. I'm still here. I'm just uh, troubleshooting the connection on my end. So give me just one minute here. All right, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, just trying to check out what is going on here uh, with my internet connection. Please forgive this brief interlude. Um, it'll be just a moment before I'm able to fully troubleshoot this. 
um, just trying to see if it's on my end, if it's on the YouTube server side. I needed a break from talking anyway to sip some coffee, so before we launch into the next topic. Okay. I'm getting some signs that for once, this may actually be on the YouTube end. Uh, this may not be uh, a problem. Oh, uh, here we go. Here's here's what's going on. I'm. S uh, all right, the bit rate is too low. I need to quickly uh, modify that. Uh, just give me two seconds, and then I should be able to. Uh, All right, uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens here. Um, all right, I'm just going to return. This is helpful. Okay. All right. Well. I'm gonna have to uh, troubleshoot that a little more. Uh, we'll see what's going on. Um, hopefully, uh, this is just a temporary blip because it looks like the internet connection is pretty good on my end. But anyway, I upped the bit rate. Hopefully, that helps. Um, connected via hardwire, so the fiber optics should be okay. Um, there we go. Stream is now healthy, so there was a little bit of a bit rate dip. So I think I was able to summarize what I wanted to about uh, Otis in Mexico uh, and the broader lessons. It is a little bit far afield from California, of course, because uh, you know California tends not to see tropical cyclone activity to the same degree as other places because the oceans are cold and all the other reasons I've recently mentioned. Although it is worth noting uh, that the tropical storm Hillary, which did affect California directly this summer, uh, at one point uh, was a rapid intensifier. So even there, there, there perhaps is an indirect connection uh, from a physical science perspective to things that are unlikely in California, but certainly not impossible. All right. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about, twitching gears a bit to California, is the decidedly less extreme weather. Uh, that the region has been seeing uh, in recent days. Um, there has been late season heat wave. There were some daily record high temperatures set in, in recent days. Right now, it's not so hot. It, it, the bigger news right now is that it's very windy and dry. In fact, some places even saw a pretty cold night last night because it's so dry. It, in places where the winds uh, decreased because uh, the boundary layer, uh, as we like to say, decoupled from the overlying windy atmosphere. You might still have winds aloft, but the ground, uh, you get this very thin, stable layer near the ground that gets cold and has weak winds uh, on nights like these, which is why you saw some places with very warm overnight temperatures in the hills up into the 50s, which is pretty warm for October, and some places in the valleys that got down uh, well into the 30s. Um, uh, so uh, lower temperatures in the valleys and warmer temperatures over the mountains. So an inversion, which is not at all unusual under patterns like this. So this is a dry and windy pattern, not a particularly hot pattern, but warm daytimes, cool nights, uh, classic autumn offshore wind pattern. Not a particularly extreme iteration of said pattern. Uh, it's, you know, we've, we've seen worse uh, in the past, certainly, but it has been very windy and there have been a couple of isolated wind gusts up above 80 miles an hour in the usual suspect spots, both in Northern and in Southern California. So this has been a wind event where everything from the Jarbo winds up in, up in, um, uh, up near Oroville uh, and Plumas County uh, the, the, the Diablo winds in the San Francisco Bay Area, East Bay Hills, Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, and the Santa Ana winds of Southern California, all the regional terms, 
for uh, the uh, land to sea winds that blow most often in the autumn and are, from a hazards perspective, uh, primarily associated with uh, mi minor wind damage, but more importantly with, with wildfire risk. And this is the, the classic time of year when you do tend to start to see major wind-driven fires in both, potentially, in both in Northern and so uh, Southern California. The Southern California offshore wind uh, fire risk season can extend much later into winter sometimes for a variety of reasons. Usually it shuts down by November in Northern California, or at least it did historically. Recently, of course, we've seen some dramatic exceptions to that, including the campfire. Uh, uh, up the devastating campfire that destroyed much of paradise uh, in early November. Fortunately, though, this year, we have very different conditions in place. So one thing that people uh, were contacting me a lot about on Thursday and Friday last week were the red flag warnings and these predictions about strong offshore winds and, and low relative humidity and critical fire weather conditions this weekend, pretty much which unfolded as predicted. And there were red flag warnings in effect, and there were some closures in effect, but and there were a few fires, but there was nothing really that got all that out of hand. They were pretty small fires that were that were extinguished fairly quickly, even under these these rather strong wind conditions and low relative humidity conditions. And there's a variety of reasons for this. You could always say that we got lucky, which there's always some element of luck involved and in the lack of ignitions in the worst possible place at the worst possible time. You might argue that some of the public safety power shutoff uh, programs have been successful. Uh, now the power agencies in California, uh, which at, at scale are mainly Pacific Gas and Electric in Northern California and Southern California Edison across much of Southern California, sometimes will shut off the electricity in very wind prone areas during high wind events to prevent their infrastructure from igniting uh, wildfires under the worst possible conditions. As far as I know, PG&E in Northern California opted not to do widespread power shutoffs during this event, although I do think, in, at least in Southern California, Edison did, in fact, shut off the power in some places. But I thought that the fact that PG&E didn't do this in Northern California was a bit of a tell as to what's going on. Because what it's an illustration of is that even a very now very risk-averse setting uh, folks are correctly recognizing that the antecedent moisture levels matter a lot. Uh, in fact, they they, re they, they aren't the, 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 the only factor that matters, but they can kind of be a switch uh, that, 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 that can be flipped on or off. If you have extremely dry vegetation conditions versus not very dry vegetation conditions, the kind of fires that you get really changes a lot. You can get fires, of course, under a wide range of vegetation dryness conditions. Really, unless it's sopping wet, you could conceivably have some vegetation somewhere that could carry a flame. But the kind of fire, the rate of spread of the fire that occurs, the literal intensity, the BTUs, the thermal units of the flaming front, uh, the, the exotic or exotic fire behavior or lack thereof in terms of generating fires generating its own weather, um, you know, generating its own winds and creating these huge ember storms and pyro tornadoes. All of that is a function of how intense the fire actually is more than anything else. And if you have a lower intensity fire, it, it, it is going to burn with, with, with literally at a lower temperature and create less extreme behavior. So that means a few different things. One is that it means that you're more likely to have beneficial fire effects in ecosystems when these fires burn more slowly at a more moderate temperature. Not necessarily a low intensity, but at least not, a, not at an extreme intensity uh, is very helpful uh, in, in potentially achieving some, some ecosystem benefits that you might get in a prescribed fire, for example, from a fire that is uh, otherwise occurring as, as an unplanned wildfire. So you tend to see more beneficial effects than harmful effects from an ecosystem and risk reduction perspective under uh, under conditions where the vegetation is not extremely dry, but is dry enough to burn, but not extremely so. Uh, the other thing that I think we've seen right now is that from a wildfire suppression perspective, the lack of exceptionally dry vegetation makes firefighting much more tractable. So, you know, if, if the vegetation is exceptionally dry, where essentially every ember that's created is igniting spot fires, and the anything that, that catches on fire is is immediately becoming uh, an intense flaming front with high flame lengths and, and high thermal intensity. 
you can imagine that under high wind conditions, that's going to become out of control and dangerous very, very fast. Uh, but if the vegetation is not that dry, you still have the winds, you still have the low humidity, but the fuels are providing a bit of an impediment to that kind of extreme fire intensity and rapid fire spread. Um, so this year, what we have, in fact, in many parts of California is an unusually moist year. Last winter was exceptionally wet. The spring was pretty cool and damp in a lot of places. And in the summer, a lot of places in California saw some out of season precipitation. Southern California saw its wettest summer on record in most places. And that includes the, the Southern Sierra and even parts of the Central Sierra. And even places along the North Coast and the Bay Area have seen at least some showers in the late summer or early autumn months. It's so it's a patchwork. There are some places that have missed out on most of these showers where vegetation is still quite dry. But on average in California, things are not nearly as extremely dry as they have been in almost all of the recent uh, years in the past decade or so. So this fall stands out as being one where vegetation is not extremely dry or record-breaking dry, you know, those are not superlatives that we should be using this year because they're not accurate. They were accurate a few years ago when we had extreme fire conditions, but they're not right now. So in an event like what we just saw, an offshore wind event with very low humidity and high winds in some places, yes, the fire risk is going to be elevated even in a year like this one, uh, where vegetation is is not completely damp, so you can still carry a flame, but is really also not extremely dry in most places. Uh, certainly not compared to what is we know is possible this time of year, when it can be almost unbelievably uh, crisp. Uh, two is that you know the the wind events are certainly necessary for fast moving fires that I think threaten a lot of lives and, and move into urban areas, but. That's an insufficient condition. You also need extremely dry vegetation conditions. And that's, of course, what we saw this year in the places that did see extremely severe fire seasons globally. The Mediterranean in Greece, a Canada, which this year suffered an almost unbelievable fire season, uh, driven by uh, almost unbelievable record-breaking warmth and dryness. Same thing on Maui. Uh, things were very dry on the western slopes there. Uh, uh, the, the, on the, the leeward side of the Hawaiian Islands leading up to the catastrophe uh, in, on, on that island. So, you know, in the places that we have seen these extreme fire events this summer, it's the extremity of the temperatures and the dryness of the vegetation, so the fuel moisture that has been what is exceptional. Rather than, say, the winds they certainly were uh, exceptional in certain cases, I guess, and on Maui is the, the most dramatic example of this. But the the challenge is that, you know, again, it, it, you can get extreme fire weather conditions from low humidity and strong winds, but if the vegetation isn't dry enough to support extreme fire behavior, you often aren't going to get it. And that's what we're seeing this year in California, fortunately. So it's a combination, yes, of some good luck, lack of ignitions perhaps in the worst possible places, but also the fact that the vegetation just isn't extremely dry this year. So I think this is something that goes both ways. When you think we need to be a little bit more cognizant of times when the risk is lower than our recent priors would suggest. So years like this one, for example, have been really favorable for much of the year and much of California for prescribed fire treatments. And there is, there's been, you know, a lot of folks have expressed a great deal of concern. You know, why the heck are we doing prescribed fires in October? Don't these people know that that's dangerous? Isn't that the peak of fire season? Well, it is sometimes, and it could be dangerous under the wrong conditions in certain years. In fact, in many years, at certain times of year, there are definitely periods where you would not want to be doing prescribed fire treatments. Uh, but you can't just look at the calendar to determine that. You really need to look at what the conditions are actually like on the ground. And this year, people doing these fuel moisture surveys, people who are out there on the landscape, ecologists and fire scientists and other folks who actually do this for a living have said, yeah, you know, it isn't, it really isn't extremely dry. The risk isn't as high in terms of wildfires. There are pretty favorable parameters for prescribed burning much of the time. And in fact, as the red flag warnings are lifted in parts of California today, especially in Northern California, there are some additional prescribed fires going forward because the vegetation moisture conditions 
are favorable for it once the winds have died down. Most, you know, generally speaking, you're not going to see prescribed fires under 50 or 60 mile an hour winds as we saw over the weekend, so they didn't occur then. But now that those winds are dying down, as it turns out, this is pretty favorable time to do these kinds of fires because we probably have more rain on the way in the next couple of weeks, just given the season, and the vegetation is dry enough to burn to achieve objectives uh, like ecosystem Im improvement and risk reduction from a wildfire perspective, but not so dry that they're going to burn with an unexpectedly or a problematically extreme intensity and evade control. So this is very much in line and very much uh, an extension of the conversation that I've been having in recent days about our recent paper on prescribed fire and climate change. I'll add another link to that uh, in the recorded version of this video, just so folks can refer back to it. But I think it's interesting to think about this because A, what does this tell us about a warming climate and wildfire risk? Well, there's any number of studies now that clearly demonstrate that climate change is making the, the wildfire situation in fire-prone regions of the world and in some not so historically fire-prone regions worse. But how is it doing so? Uh, generally speaking, it's not magically causing the vegetation to uh, spontaneously combust. That's a, an argument that sometimes folks use as a, as a gotcha that isn't really a gotcha uh, because there are any number of ignition sources for fires. Uh, in many places like California, most of them are human caused. That does not mean that they're intentional or arson. In most cases, it's generally accidental causes, some of which you know range on a scale of of negligence, some of which are not really on that scale, though. I mean, it is, I think sometimes people forget just how easy it is to accidentally spark a blaze with a power tool or something, you know, that even goes wrong if someone's house catches on fire in the, in the urban interface and it spreads to the vegetation or someone's car on the side of the road is overheating. These are things that are not necessarily uh, fully avoidable. That's not like anybody did these things on purpose and yet then the fire starts. Uh, then, you know, there's things like power lines, uh, there are things that are, you know, truly obvious negligence, like throwing a, a cigarette butt in the dry grass or something. But the point is, there's any number of human caused sor sources for ignitions. There are also natural ignitions. There's, there's lightning and a handful of other things globally, but mostly lightning. But the main reason why climate change is affecting wildfire risk is through vegetation aridity. So in the business, uh, fuel moisture. And what it's doing is it's increasingly allowing uh, large diameter fuels, so these 100,000 and even 10,000 hour fuels where they exist, to become much drier during dry spells. And it also means that finer fuels, so the, the, gra the grass and light brush, the so-called uh, 1 to uh, 10 or 100 hour fuels, uh, th this is living vegetation that's responding to variations in atmospheric humidity and, and soil moisture very rapidly. But in a warming climate, we know that the vapor pressure deficit, the floor, and the difference between the floor and the ceiling on how intense evaporation uh, can become uh, between how much water vapor is actually in the air and how much could potentially be in the air is driving increased atmospheric thirstiness. I call it the increasing, the exponentially growing atmospheric sponge. So even the living vegetation that responds rapidly, so these, these one and 10 hour fuels uh, to variations, even day to day, in humidity and winds, are going to be able to dry out faster following rainfall than they used to. So the main mechanism that connects climate change and wildfires is aridity, vegetation moisture. And what we're seeing this year in California is the opposite end of that pendulum swing. Vegetation moisture is unusually high this year. It's been pretty darn damp. That's given us a reprieve. It's given us a great window for prescribed fire. It's given us a year where we haven't seen a great deal of severe wildfire activity, really only in the northwestern corner of the state where it's been drier. But everywhere else, this was a, pre this was a very quiet wildfire year in California, even though we've had some uh, high wind and uh, low humidity conditions. Uh, but the corollary to that is that inevitably the pendulum is going to swing back the other way. So I don't think, unfortunately, uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, these terrible fire years, I don't think those were an anomaly or a blip. They were a, a temporary high point, but we will be back there uh, a few years from now, and we could be in a worse place at some point in the future. This, as this pendulum swings back and forth between increasingly wet and increasingly dry conditions in an alternating fashion in California.
And then my point here is that we need to, A, take advantage of those windows that are quieter to do the kind of work that we, need, that we know we need to do to mitigate the risks when the pendulum swings back in the other direction. So that's all sorts of uh, prescribed fire treatments and other risk reduction treatments that can be done much more safely and much more attractively at scale in years like this year. I wish we had done more this year, but there has been some good work on the ground. Uh, then the other thing is that we really, you know, I often see this in news stories uh, and I cringe every time. Uh, Cal Fire puts out these statistics too, is like the five-year trend in fire activity. Well, if you look at the five-year trend now in fire activity, there's a very strong decreasing trend in California wildfire statistics of almost every kind. But that is almost entirely irrelevant to anything that matters because it just says that you know, there, there is natural variability on a cycle of, of, of less than 10 years that re, any given five-year period, you can see, you know, strong trends in any direction. But if you look at the overall trend, it is towards increasing extreme fire years, even though we still get some of these really quiet years interspersed with them. We've also seen this in places like Canada, where folks have used long-term time series to mislead about the context of this year's fire season, which is definitely related to climate change. But this it is sometimes complicated because Canada still sees a lot of years with very little wildfire activity, but increasingly it's seeing individual years with ever increasing extreme levels of activity. So you see these, it's very spiky and the spikes just keep getting bigger, but there are a lot of years in between uh, that are much milder. California sees less variation. Historically, we tend to see a relatively high number of active years overall. But we are also seeing that we still get certain years with very low activity, and that has a few implications. One, as I mentioned, we should be taking advantage of it, but two, we shouldn't get lulled into a false sense of security just because we have a couple of mild years in a row. It does not mean that the 2010s were a blip. It does not mean that we're not gonna end up there again the next time things dry out. Uh, and there's even an argument to be made, and there's actually some interesting paleoclimate research on this front uh, suggesting uh, that the alternation between very wet and very dry conditions is in fact, in some ways, the worst possible sequencing for producing episodic, very extreme fire years, which if you think about it from an ecological perspective, makes a lot of sense, and in particular from a fuel moisture perspective, because of course, if you have those really wet years, you're getting plenty of moisture for all of that vegetation to grow or regrow, fill in the gaps for, uh, between recent fires and cause denser vegetation growth, more lush growth in flammable places. But then you have the very dry periods that follow where you lose all of that soil moisture, but all of that vegetation that grew during the wet period is still there. It's just much drier than it was before. So you have more fuel for the fire and also the fuel is drier than it used to be during the dry times. And I do think that's likely to be uh, a sequencing that we see uh, in California moving forward, where we do see these increasingly wet spells on the one hand, but these increasingly dry spells on the other. And as these alternate, we'll go from very extreme, increasingly extreme individual fire seasons and fire years, or clusters of them perhaps, to clusters of years or individual years that are really mild. And so if talked about hydroclimate whiplash and precipitation whiplash, maybe we also need to be thinking about wildfire burning condition whiplash from year to year. Um, that's one of the things I think that's that's kind of fascinating about all of this is that you miss a lot of what's going on if you only look at the average. All right, uh, so I think I've reached the hour, but I haven't answered uh, any questions yet. So uh, I want to at least go through and, and look at what's there. There actually aren't too many comments today since I know it's been a bit of a monologue day. So um, I will go through and take a look at what we've got. Let's see here. Okay, there's some comments about the, the video earlier. I'm glad it seemed to settle out. Maybe there was just a temporary internet disruption in the neighborhood. Maybe it was the YouTube server. I'm not quite sure. Okay, so there really aren't there really aren't too many questions today. Uh, that's fine with me. It saves me uh, my voice. A couple of notes, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you are interested in grabbing a copy of my Extreme Weather and Climate Calendar uh, for 2024, there will also be a 2025 version coming out next year. 
Uh, the link is in the top of the, the, the first, the very beginning of the, of the chat section today. I'll add a, embed a link into the post. The, the publisher told me there's a Halloween only coupon uh, t- valid tomorrow for 20% off, which is uh, the coupon code is Halloween, all caps, also uh, listed up in the comments. And I will plan on having uh, a couple more uh, frequent conversations soon. Um, I will uh, try and get on a more weekly schedule moving forward, although the day might shift a bit. You may notice that I try and favor Monday mornings, uh, but sometimes that shifts around. So uh, next time, I'll probably be talking about El Nino again uh, and doing a more open-ended one where I'll uh, ask more questions. So if you want to uh, interact a bit uh, additionally, uh, more than this time, uh, feel free to come next time, and I think we'll have more time for a back-and-forth conversation. Um, and with that, I think I'll probably call it, call, it a, call it an office hour. But thanks again for joining, and as always, this will be recorded and available uh, for review, uh, pretty quickly after I put